This is the Fixer Punk Podcast, the podcast that believes in negotiating leverage for all, not just the wealthy. I'm Grayson Peltier. The GOP's agenda overall and their debt ceiling and economic agenda around this uh, not wanting to raise the debt ceiling and also the overall narrative of recession is designed, and I'm coming to realize this more and more and more every single day, it is designed specifically and not just as an accident, but specifically to erode the negotiating leverage and power of workers. That is what it is there to do. It's not there to cut federal spending. It's not there to save the government money. It's not there to reduce the deficit or to reduce the debt. It's not even there to reduce inflation. What it is doing is it is doing the bidding of large employers who, and even smaller employers that have, that have money and are donating to Republican candidates um, that want to be able to treat workers poorly and pay them far less than they're worth. And they are changing the market dynamics in a way that employees who have only now started to get back some of the gains in productivity that they've had over years and get those back in the form of wages and catch up to that gap of, of over-concentration of wealth that has gone to the upper, upper classes – just now as we're starting to catch up on that and as bosses are starting to treat workers a little bit better, they are bringing this in for that specific purpose. And if you look at the Kevin McCarthy debt ceiling plan, you will know that right away. Obviously, I have went over how the idea of inflation and the fear of recession, those things, that fear in and of itself is designed to push workers to not want to demand more from their employers, to make them scared of asking for raises, to make them scared of leaving their jobs, to make them scared of just doing their job and not going over and above and beyond when the employer is barely paying them anything, to make them scared of organizing and unionizing and the risk of going on strike. And That is what's gone on with this economic narrative and workers, there are already some articles coming out saying workers are losing their leverage and it sadly looks like it's true, at least from my impression of the situation, a lot of the lower wage jobs are not being as generous as they were, not that they were generous to begin with after the pandemic, but they were being a bit more generous, maybe treating workers a little bit better, throwing a little bit more money at things and now it has come down. But the upper classes are not satisfied with just what fear, uncertainty, doubt, and inflation is doing to force workers back into their iron grip and into their prison bars. They want more. So Kevin McCarthy, he actually shows up at the New York Stock Exchange to talk to the people that he works for, which are the large moneyed financial industry donors Um, and the large corporations that are publicly traded and whose profit margins are being supposedly affected by the fact that workers have a little bit more leverage and they want to make more money by forcing workers to work for less. And he talks about his debt ceiling plan, which is now introduced, the quote-unquote earn, save, the, the limit, save, grow act, as he calls it. Um, to raise the debt ceiling, which is not even – raising the debt ceiling affects money that's already been spent. Not It doesn't, it doesn't have anything to do with the budget. Um, the budget's already technically approved. But the debt ceiling is um, – if that is not raised, what happens is the United States government defaults on its debt, which makes U.S. treasuries not pay out. And then that destabilizes the currency and hence the world economy because – a lot of like money that's in banks and in all types of financial instruments is held in United States treasuries, and that money doesn't get paid out if the debt ceiling isn't raised. Um, and normally, until the Tea Party era back in between like 2010 and to, to 2016, um, raising the debt ceiling was no question. And in fact, during Trump's administration, there was no question around raising the debt ceiling. But now that Republicans have power over the House, um, they are making it a question. And if and this is this is basically Russian roulette with the economy. 
if they decide if the debt ceiling is not raised, you collapse the world economy. So they are putting out there their list of demands, which they're making on behalf of their corporate donors, I am certain. And the fact that the presentation of this before the bill was introduced was done at the New York Stock Exchange just confirms it. And the text of the bill obviously shows it as well. Um, but he's in there saying that they're going to make work requirements for public benefits, which there already are. For SNAP, there already is a work requirement, but they're going to strengthen that work requirement. And what that serves to do is SNAP is food stamps. So basically, if you don't have a job, then you won't be able to get food assistance. And that's already the case, but there are certain exemptions for like really high unemployment, there were exemptions during COVID because of the because of the pandemic and the fact that you couldn't leave your house and that there are people getting sick and all of that. Those are going away on their own, but they're going to um, make the work requirements even harsher um, on that so that even if there are issues where, where you have very high unemployment, where everybody's unemployed, which is what they're pushing for with this recession, um, States won't be able to waive those work requirements, and you just you'll be out of a job by no fault of your own, and because and you can't get a job, and you will still be required to somehow work in order to receive the paltry amount of food stamp benefits, which we're talking like a hundred to three hundred dollars a month that can just be spent strictly on on food, not on anything else. Um, but that's not even the most egregious part of this. The most egregious part of this is taking away health insurance, health coverage from low-income people through Medicaid, um, through what's called a Medicaid work requirement, which there's one state that managed to implement it and a few states have tried it, but it was rejected by the courts. Um, and what that does is in order to get Medicaid, which is just medical insurance, basically, um, it requires you to have a job in order to get it or to be certified by a doctor as being disabled and also um, students are going are going to be exempt um, from this as well and and certain people with caregiving duties are going to be exempted but really it's not um, a, a group of medical organizations including the American Lung Association the American Cancer Society um, the American Heart Association um, I said it's not about work, it's about paperwork, which that is very true. Because when these work requirements have been experimented with, you wind up having tens of thousands of people losing their health coverage. And people didn't even know. I think it, the, there was a survey that 70% of people um, in the one state where this was tried didn't know whether or not this policy was in place. And you have to go into a website every single month to certify that you have met the work requirements. So a lot of people who were working, they just lost their health insurance because they had to go onto some confusing government portal to report that information. And the majority, the overwhelming majority of people who are on who are on Medicaid are already working. Um, and those that are not are not working because of caregiving, illness, or disability, or school attendance. And you, they're basically saying, okay, we're going to take away your health insurance if you're not if you're not going to work. So what does that do? What does that do and how does that connect to workers' power and to working conditions and the rise in unionization and the ways that workers have power over their employers? Because conservatives want you to believe that there is a free market for labor and there's a free market where you can choose what employer to go to. You can make those choices. You can get another job. Um, you don't have to go and work for the same employer. But what these work requirements effectively do is lock you in to hold on for dear life, literally, to that job. Because you can't really negotiate. If you lose your job, then you could lose your health insurance. So the very program, Medicaid, that's supposed to be there to give you health insurance when you're not at work getting health insurance from your job is taken away from you if you don't have a job. So... What so and it, so that that would make you not want to leave your job. That'll make you a lot more subservient to your employer. Basically, it's putting a legal mandate that that in order to receive health coverage, that you sell a service to your employer at whatever rate they offer you, 
And if you don't, then you're at risk of losing your health insurance, which that is a market distorting um, effect. So now you go into your boss who is underpaying you, who is scheduling you for all kinds of random hours at random times of the day, making you come in really late at night and then early in the morning, treats you like crap, and you say, I'm going to quit your job. I'm going to quit my job. That boss is going to be like, no, you're not because you're going to lose your Medicaid. Or at least that's what they'll be thinking in the back of their minds even if they don't say it. So it forces you to stay there. Then let's say you and a few coworkers decide that you want to unionize. And then you go on strike. Or you're in a union and you have a vote to strike. Um, now the problem is going to be that if there are any people in that workplace that are on Medicaid, there is no exemption in the law for striking. So you would still be required to show up to work. So this literally breaks strikes. This Medicaid work requirement and the SNAP work requirements literally break strikes because you would not be able to go on strike or else you'd lose both your food, which you already had that policy. And you lose your health insurance too. So that is that definitely that that changes the dynamic of the marketplace. It is it is literally coercion to sell services under terms and and at rates that are lower than you would sell them at otherwise. So this is not a, this is this is creating the antithesis of a free market um, for labor. Because they really don't care about the free market. They just care about giving power to the large capitalists and the people that he literally first presented the plan to. Which, of course, he's going to say, oh, yeah, this is not a this is not a cut, which is technically not. And that's the super insidious thing about work requirements is that because people have become so gaslit themselves and they have convinced themselves in their mind to believe that if they've even achieved a middle class or especially an upper middle class way of life, that it is solely because of their own work and that no, no, nobody helped them and that they made it all themselves and that nobody's going to take this from me and anybody who's taking welfare is lazy and they are and they're bad people and they're stealing from me because this has become so internalized in America, especially among conservatives who have been exposed to a lot of conservative media. They see a class of people. They're saying, well, the poor have to have to prove that they're deserving. You have to earn the right to be able to get health insurance. And they have and they're and they're willing to just punish people. The average person then thinks, okay, yeah, there's a work requirement. They're not gonna see it as a cut. And that's the insidious part of it, is they're like, okay, this is making the normal everyday person who's making a middle class income. It's going to make them have more animosity to poor people because if you try to repeal the work requirement, it's kind of, it's kind of stuck in there because you're going to make it say, it's going to make it sound like if you're a lawmaker who comes in and tries to repeal this work requirement later, it's going to make it sound like oh yeah, you're enabling laziness, you're enabling people to not work, and then the person at home who's like I'm working so hard and I'm paying all these taxes and look at me. Look at how strong I am and how good I am that I make the money and I earn my health insurance. They are going to hear that politician. They're like, kick those lazy bums out. Give them, get, them, get them off their health insurance. That's why it's so important to change the cultural narrative. There's not, so, there's not much we can do within the course of an election campaign to fix this kind of stuff. Because when you have these internalized ideas that, you, that, that you're better than everybody else or you're better than those who are in the class right beneath you because you quote unquote earned everything, which that's not to negate your hard work. That's not to negate all the work you did. You did the hard work. If you're one of those people who's making a good middle-class income, you did a lot of hard work. You've done a ton of work. You've done more work than most of the people that are wealthy and you should be proud of what you've done. But there's no reason for you to want to remove that ladder from beneath you and topple those beneath you there's nothing that 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 doing that does to benefit you and the money's not really coming from you this is all pretty much an illusion this debt ceiling negotiation all these things are an illusion because number one the national debt goes down more um and deficits go down more under democratic administrations and also the it's based upon the stability of the monetary system and the overall productivity of the economy, not based upon the federal budget. 
Um, modern monetary theory is pretty complex. I, I can't explain it here, but you can look it up. But federal budgets don't work the way that a home or even a business budget would. And also these things wind up costing more in terms of administrative costs to get all this, collect all this data about all these people to chase people down and figure out how much hours they're working, whether or not they're still in school, to try to get disability certifications from doctors. That all costs money and that all takes time and that is going to increase the expense of this thing. Meanwhile, the overwhelming majority of these programs do meet the requirements. Like those health groups said, this is a paperwork thing, not about work, because the majority of people are going to be able to meet them, but there are just going to be some people, people who have limited English proficiency, people who live in areas without internet access, people who don't understand how to use technology, people with disabilities who are just not going to meet the requirements. Um, even though they do meet the requirements, they're not going to fill out the paperwork and they're going to get and they're going to get lost in the shuffle. And of course, that's not even to mention people with um, disabilities that are that are invisible or that are less transparent because there is a way to get yourself exempted through a doctor's certification, but it doesn't like auto, it doesn't automatically exempt those who have went through the very very grueling social security SSI determination process and got Medicaid through that. So people with people who have gotten SSI who have gone to court and proven that they're disabled through a very very arduous process, they're still going to have to go to their doctor and remember to get this form and upload it into some website in order to keep their coverage. Um, but then there are people with invisible disabilities, conditions that are more complex, more complicated, that are going to be they're more difficult to recognize. Um, people that are applying for these programs and haven't had medical care in years and don't yet have a formal diagnosis for their conditions, it's going to be more difficult for them to get that doctor to sign off on that special form saying that they're too disabled to work. And there's a lot of medical gaslighting that goes on, especially for women and people of color who have serious medical conditions that are not fully recognized by the medical community. And they're going to lose the access to get the health coverage that they need to prove that their health condition is serious enough for them to be able to be exempt from the work requirement. So basically, it's just it's basically just feeding upon itself. And they'd be scared to apply because they don't want to have to go through the whole traumatic process of trying to convince a doctor that they are in fact disabled in order for them to get the health care that they need. Um, that's going to be a huge, huge problem um, because you you have a lot of people who are in that type of situation. You have, and you have people that are dealing with these terribly abusive workplaces that are in fact getting health problems as a result of them. The Surgeon General had a report saying that abusive workplaces are causing people tons of actual health problems. And these requirements literally... There was a claim and there's been a claim that this work requirement that work improves people's health. And these are people that don't understand the meaning of correlation versus causation. Um, they don't understand that it literally means if somebody can go into work that maybe they're healthier because they can go in to work and actually and, and do a job versus somebody who medically can't. So it's a correlation Correlation is not equaling causation. It's not the work that's causing it. It's because the person is healthy enough to endure it. Um, but they have never seen, people who say that have never understood the extent to which workplaces can become abusive physically and mentally. And I would say it's the majority of workplaces. I am, I'm not going to say it's the minority. I'm gonna, I, I am confident that the majority or maybe even the overwhelming majority of workplaces and employment that is available to the average American, I'm not talking about the highly specialized, highly technically skilled worker. I'm talking about the typical person who has even even a bachelor's degree from college or even a master's degree, but it's not like a highly technical, highly experienced. I'm not talking about somebody who has like 10, 20 years of experience. But the type of work experience most people are subjected to in this country is with some sort of abuse. You have employers who believe that they can call on a worker 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year while paying them $7.25 an hour. You have employers who are willing to schedule people. Oh yeah, one week we'll schedule you for 25 hours. We'll never get you above 30 hours because then we have to give you health insurance. But we'll schedule you for 20 hours one week, then 15 hours the next week, and then, and then 21 the next week and very random scheduling. 
And when you come into work, you're treated like crap, not only by your by your bosses, but also by your customers, because we've allowed this Karen culture of people getting mad at customer service workers instead of being mad at the people who write the policies in these businesses, which I believe in consumer advocacy. But mowing down low-wage workers doesn't help you get anywhere. Um, so you create literally a traumatic experience for most people going into the workplace. You have employers who want to force people back into the office for the sole purpose of taunting them and feeling like they have control over them, even though they're more productive at home and they're costing them money in that case. And you have people who are living in rural communities who maybe who can't even get to the workplace, stop commuting a ton and they are they're going to wind up losing money in this whole deal by go, by having to go and find a job and this is all the whole reason people would gladly 100% take good take jobs if they were good jobs if you manage to make those retail fast food jobs that that are the majority of jobs in this country right now that that need to be filled if you made them good People will do them, and I, I stated before my the case study of people doing Uber Eats and DoorDash and those types of things, delivery jobs that you think are low-wage jobs and driver jobs of like Uber and Lyft. You have people that are even in higher income brackets that are doing those things for extra money, and people would do some of these more quote-unquote menial jobs for extra money if the employers actually treated people better. So literally what is happening is, is that instead of – fixing the workplace, treating people better, letting workers unionize, and actually just being a dignified person while you're a manager in a workplace, they're going, the 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 corporate overlords, the folks, the big New York Stock Exchange traded companies are going to politicians to solve their problem for them and say, we can't get them to come into work for us voluntarily. So why don't you go and conscript this labor to us? And put them straight into our hands so we can lock them up, tie them down, and shackle them down economically into our crappy seven twenty-five an hour job that we can't find anybody to work. And maybe they still won't even get to keep their Medicaid because some weeks we might schedule them for 19 hours a week instead of the 20 hours a week that is required by your rule. And then they'll have to make it up with some sort of community service hours or whatever. And some states... Um, that have tried the whole Medicaid work requirement thing won't even let you choose your community service. They'll they'll choose it for you. And my guess is it's probably going to be nonprofit organizations that are controlled by somebody who, who is given a lot of money to a politician. Although this version of the bill seems to allow you to choose your community service. So that's that's one positive thing. Um and that's that's how this all works is the snap work requirements they 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 don't improve employment there is there is no evidence that this improves employment all this does is it takes people who are already in jobs and worsens worsens their working conditions that's all that that's all this is about and that's all the entirety of the really this whole plan is about um because it also it makes all kinds of other discretionary spending cuts it it cuts it even it even cuts veterans care it cuts um remainder of covid relief funds that are that are, that are going to be used to improve transportation it makes a whole bunch of cuts and when you remove money from the economy like that you uh, overall you create a greater level of fear uncertainty and doubt in the economy you create fear uncertainty and doubt in the economy and that forces people to be scared to take the next step, to take that action that is necessary to improve their financial conditions. Because the action for most workers that is necessary to improve their financial conditions and live their best life financially is not cutting back on their daily coffee or cutting some sort of minor expense. It is arguing and negotiating collectively or individually in some cases for a higher wage and better conditions. That is what improves financial outcomes for people. That is what improves health outcomes for people. If work improves health in any way, it's the jobs that are treating people well, not the jobs that are treating people poorly. And that is what they are pushing for, is to have jobs continue to treat you poorly. And you also, of course, you you, you can't have one of these bills without 
without um, taking away uh, taking away from your other hated thing as a Republican, which is climate change. Which so they are repealing green energy tax credits, and of course they're blocking student loan forgiveness, which I didn't mention it at the outset because it's kind of a given. It's going to the to it's going to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is they they're they're bought and paid for specifically Clarence Thomas by the same people who want this debt ceiling plan to go through, um, and for and those same employers, the same people who want to keep you stuck as their slaves. Um, and with that, and then of course the student loan debt, the student loan debt thing, of course that's going to drive some people in there, and what it's also going to do is. Keep in mind that the people that he spoke to, again, the symbolism is very, very important here. Kevin McCarthy spoke to was the New York Stock Exchange. And big companies don't like competition. So let's say you're a highly educated professional. Now you have to pay your student, you have to pay student loan debt and you're, pay, and you're paying interest on it. And you're probably never going to actually pay off the principal on these student loans because that's the way they're designed is so you never pay off the principal and you have to pay the pay interest payments on it for the rest of your life. That's part of the big scam of them. So it's not like a mortgage where you have a term on it. You could be paying interest on these things for the rest of your lives if you if there are, and then you have to go through legal processes and whatever, even if you've been paying it 30 years or whatever. And 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 you paid it back more than multiple times you have to go through all kinds of legal processes to get them to stop charging you and even that sometimes doesn't work um but now you're put in a situation where let's say you have money saved up and you are going to start your own business you are going to offer your services independently but now your source of health insurance while you're making no money because when you're starting a new business your income is zero or it's negative number because you're spending money on business expenses, you could get Medicaid. After Obamacare, if you're an entrepreneur starting out your business, you're not making money, you could get Medicaid. But now this bill, it's not very clear as to what it says about self-employment. It just says employment in there for 20 hours a week. But it could force you, depending on how states interpret this, and I feel like states may interpret this differently, like I'm in California, I might be a little safer than some of you who are in a red state. Um, but Cal, but um, it'll require you to go and have actual employment rather than being able to ha- keep your health insurance while you're building up your new business. Um, and and that's going to be a concern because there are because there are people that are out there that can that that can succeed in doing their own thing and running their own businesses and having their time freedom, having flexibility, having power actually for once in their life, having power over their income and not being chained to whatever the whims of their bosses are and having that independence and having equity, having ownership over what they're doing. Now that opportunity is being ripped away from them and they're forced to go back and work for their corporate overlords, which the whole employer based health insurance system does this anyway but obamacare and the um and, and medicaid expansion helped this quite a bit allowed a lot of professionals and people to be able to go and start their own businesses and actually increase the economy over the longer term because you have a more vibrant system of competition but that's not what they want they're, they don't want, they don't want a free market they don't want a free market with vibrant competition they want their donors to win that's what this is about. This is not about improving competition. This is about making sure that their donors win. And then you have that same professional, highly educated professional, maybe somebody with some sort of degree that, that's related to their field, like a doctor, dentist, lawyer, has a bunch of student loan debt. You take away the student loan debt pause. You take away relief. You especially take away student loan relief that was supposed to help those who were lower income during during college. Um, the extra ten thousand dollars worth in cancellation. Um, you take away the improved income based repayment plan, which would limit the repayment of your student loans to a certain percentage, uh, to a lower percentage of income than it normally would be, and allows it to be forgiven sooner. And you have a massive financial double triple whammy around you, and there's no way you're going to be able to go and start your new business 
that's going to be a con- and, and then that's going to have a massive damper um, economically for these people who would have potentially been able to succeed and really do well. Um, now they can't because they are stuck with payments. They're stuck with not having health insurance, and that's exactly how they want it to be. And for our workers who wanted to be able to negotiate better wages, they wanted to hold out to make sure that they actually get a job that's within their skill set, a job that aligns with what they've learned in school, um, and a job that'll pay them a fair wage. No, they're stuck. They have to stick with whatever job they have. If they lose their job, they lose their health insurance. So it decreases economic mobility because you can't actually move up except if you're staying with the same employer because... You generally have to, especially if you're like somebody who had, who had like a who was relatively recent college graduate. You you would have a a lower wage job that you're stuck in temporarily, but then you might have to leave that job in order to try to go into another field, into the field that you actually studied for, and this isn't going to give you the ability to do that. You could save up all the money you want, but you're not going to be able to keep your health insurance, um, and people are just going to be it's not it creating economic progress it is literally creating economic stagnation for the average person for the big companies that want to make sure that they have people captive to poor labor practices it'll create economic growth growth for them but this is not creating economic growth for anybody who is even remotely close to being a normal average person and certainly not for anybody beneath that. And it's going to result in a lot of cruelty because do you really think that the person who is homeless, living on the streets, mentally ill, um, possibly having some problems in their life, that they're going to have that they're going to have the wherewithal to think of going onto some government portal every single month to certify their status um, to just to keep their health insurance? I would hope that that outreach would be done in an appropriate way so that those certifications get uploaded. But we all know that people who are unhoused, who have nowhere to go, people, they'll wind up just going to the emergency room over and over again. And, and, and they're going to wind up, um, they don't have a doctor who's going to remember to call them and make sure that they are getting their certification into the system and making sure that they're declared as disabled and they're going to lose their health insurance and they're going to wind up still going back to the emergency room with their acute concerns. But this time around, it's not being covered by insurance, so they're not going to get as much care and they're going to be they're going to wind up with a bunch of medical debt. So it's very cruel. And people often say about the GOP, the cruelty is the point. And I'm going to expand on that. The cruelty and the lack of leverage for workers is the point. And the point, or really you could say the cruelty is the point, and the point of the cruelty is to keep you down and to keep you subservient to the upper class of capitalists. So I hope you got that message through today and you understand the true intention behind pretty much every single GOP policy related to economics that is all based around subjugating the power of labor and reducing the power that workers have in their workplace in order to protect employers from doing the right thing. They are protecting employers not from some sort of unfair infringement or from some sort of impediment to their business, but they are protecting them from having to do the right thing, which is to pay their workers well and to treat them well. Because if they did that, if we, instead of creating this bill here, this uh, this debt ceiling bill with all these work requirements requiring workers to do things, if we have the limit, if we took the Limit Save Grow Act and we turned it into the limit employers being jackholes, save workers from being oppressed and grow the wages that you're paying your workers act, that would fix the labor shortage problem really, really easily. Just write a bill saying that you have to treat your workers better. You have to pay them a living wage. You have to make sure that they're given benefits and that they are given 
fair treatment and fair scheduling in the workplace and be open to offering all kinds of alternative work arrangements to help those people with those invisible disabilities who are basically just who you guys use conservatives which is called freeloaders really they're people that are fighting with for their life with serious health conditions that are just not being properly detected or that they're being medically gaslit about and some of these people are really smart people really strong people that can do a lot of good stuff in your in your work environment and if you bring those people in and you actually just remove some of your biases toward what a quote unquote good worker looks like to you, you could solve that labor shortage just then and there. But they refuse to do that. And instead, they go and they whine and they cry to Congress. And then Congress just gives them what they want. And now we have to know whether or not Joe Biden is going to give these wealthy capitalists and oppressive bad bosses what they want and there is now a double bind for joe biden i have no doubts in my mind that joe biden does not want medicaid work requirements he does not want the enhanced snap work requirements that he actually wants to try to help people through these programs but at this point now they're putting this bill into the hands of the democrats and it's not going to pass the senate And then now what this does is this is going to allow Republicans to go and they're going to be able to say to people who are not awake, who are not informed as to how their power as workers is being eroded by these social safety net cuts. They're going to be able to go and say, look, look, the the debt ceiling is not being raised because Democrats are willing to enable lazy bums. And the reason why the whole economy crashed and the debt ceiling was not raised if that happens is because the Democrats want to enable people to be lazy. That's why this whole laziness and getting help narrative has to go. And that has to be one of the biggest priorities of our political communication as progressives, is getting rid of that cultural narrative around people who are getting benefits are lazy and people who who don't want to be abused by their bosses are lazy. Because that's what they're going to do is they are putting this on the table strategically in this way and phrasing their cuts to Medicaid as quote unquote work requirements just to make sure that you are oppressed for as long as possible and that those who are just above you, who are closer to you, who if they fall down the rung, one bad thing happens to you, they are in your situation where they're back being poor and broke and needing that assistance and wishing they hadn't voted against that assistance that they are they are now oppressing you they are now the level directly beneath directly above you is oppressing the level is oppressing that level that's directly beneath them and doing the bidding of those on the top who are also oppressing them and that's how they want it they want to make it seem like the democrats are unreasonable and that's what mccarthy is already saying well if joe biden and the democrats and the senate don't approve this then they're the ones being unreasonable they're willing to crash the world economy because they don't want to impose work requirements and they don't want to make people go to work and that is a very powerful narrative and that is something that we need to be very very scared of And the oppression from other members of the working class is insane in the way that they are able to mobilize people. And I worked in conservative advocacy for years. Is their way they're able to mobilize people to hate on the lower classes is extremely, extremely effective. And it's very, very dangerous. So this is going to be this is going to be a very very rough time but you need to make sure that you get them word out that this is what this is about. This isn't about saving money and this isn't about making sure that people go to work. This is about oppressing people and keeping their wages down and hurting people with health conditions and and about reordering the marketplace so that the rich can get richer and so the poor get poorer. And please follow on social media to spread the message um, at FixerPunk on Instagram and TikTok, at Grayson Nation on Twitter. Um, you can send in any questions, concerns. If through this tumultuous time you have any personal concerns, stories, things you want to talk about, um, about the ways that the system is oppressing you, or if you have questions or curiosities, things you want me to look into, 
or if you just want to rant about how bad your boss is, you can call in, leave a voicemail anytime, 24 hours a day at 844-477-7865, 844-477-PUNK. You can also email me, Grayson, at offspeedsolutions.com. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen today, and I hope you have a great rest of your day and that you choose to join me again for the next episode.